A bit of recap then before we look at phosphocreatine. So how do muscle fibers usually make the ATP that they need for muscle contraction? Well, obviously the ideal scenario is aerobic respiration, which uses oxygen as the final electron acceptor. Now, this is just revision. We can't go through the whole of aerobic respiration again, but you should know that with aerobic respiration, you make ATP during glycolysis because you get a net gain of two ATP. Uh, you make four ATP, but two ATP were needed at the start to phosphorylate the glucose to make it unstable or more reactive. You don't make any ATP during the link reaction, but you do make ATP during the Krebs cycle. You make one molecule of ATP per Krebs cycle by substrate level phosphorylation. And then obviously you make loads of ATP in the final stage of aerobic respiration, which is called oxidative phosphorylation. This uses an electron transport chain. It takes place on the cristae of the mitochondria. And if oxygen is available to act as the final electron acceptor, you'll get electrons being transferred down the electron transport chain in a series of redox reactions. That provides the energy to pump the protons into the intermembrane space. They then diffuse back down the proton gradient through the ATP synthase enzyme. And ATP synthase makes ATP from ADP and PI. And you get absolutely loads in oxidative phosphorylation. I think it's 28 molecules of ATP. So that's aerobic respiration and it makes the most ATP. It doesn't produce lactic acid as a byproduct. So it is the ideal scenario for muscles to make ATP, but it can only happen if sufficient oxygen is available. Now, obviously skeletal muscles can use anaerobic respiration, but this is much less efficient because it makes much less ATP. Remember with anaerobic, we only have glycolysis. So we've only got that net gain of two ATP. So it produces ATP quickly and it can be useful for muscles if they run out of oxygen, but we're only gonna get that net gain of two ATP because we only get glycolysis as an ATP producing stage. That then makes pyruvate. Pyruvate then is um, reduced to regenerate the NAD. So at least glycolysis can continue, but we do get lactic acid which is acidic, so it will lower the pH of these muscle fibers. And if it builds up, it causes muscle fatigue, muscle cramp, it damages the muscle fibers because it is acidic. So ideally, we wanna delay the onset of anaerobic respiration and make more ATP via aerobic respiration. Now, the third way that we haven't learned about yet, skeletal muscles are unique in that they have a third way of producing ATP. So if they are not making enough ATP through aerobic or anaerobic respiration, they can use what we call the ATP phosphocreatine system. And this is because muscle fibers contain phosphocreatine. Or sometimes you see it called creatine phosphate. It's the same thing, but on AQA, they tend to call it phosphocreatine. So let's have a look at how this works. Phosphocreatine can be shortened to this, capital P, capital C, capital R, phosphocreatine. And phosphocreatine can provide phosphate to produce ATP, or you can say it can provide phosphate to phosphorylate ADP to produce ATP. Because literally what happens is the phosphocreatine is broken down, okay? So imagine phosphocreatine, oh, that should be a lowercase r. Phosphocreatine is broken down into the phosphate group and the creatine. That phosphate group can then join with ADP to make ATP. It's as simple as that. So phosphocreatine is broken down or hydrolyzed and the phosphate group or the inorganic phosphate is used to phosphorylate ADP 
to really quickly make ATP. And this process is reversible. So if you've got excess ATP, say you've got lots of oxygen available and you've been doing lots of aerobic respiration in your skeletal muscles, if you've got lots of ATP in excess, then the ATP can be hydrolyzed into ADP and PI, and the phosphate group can be used to rejoin with a creatine molecule to remake that phosphocreatine. So if you hydrolyze ATP, the phosphate can be used to remake the phosphocreatine, and obviously you've hydrolyzed the ATP, so you've now got ADP, but then if muscles need more ATP, you can use the phosphocreatine, hydrolyze the phosphocreatine, take the phosphate group and use it to phosphorylate ADP to make ATP and creatine. It's as simple as that. But skeletal muscles do this. They have a supply of phosphocreatine to break down the phosphocreatine to use the phosphate to phosphorylate ADP to make ATP. Let's have a look at an exam question. Not many on this, but there's one here. What is the role of phosphocreatine? They've called it PC here. We can call it PCR. In providing energy during muscle contraction. Now, this was a two mark question and all you had to say was phosphocreatine or phosphocreatine provides the phosphate to make ATP. It was that easy. Or you could say phosphocreatine provides the phosphate to phosphorylate ADP, because obviously if you phosphorylate ADP, you make ATP. Now you can call it phosphate, you can call it phosphate group, you can call it inorganic phosphate or PI, or you can put a phosphate in a circle, but you're breaking down the phosphocreatine to provide a phosphate group to phosphorylate ADP to make ATP. So muscles always have a supply of ATP, even if there's not enough oxygen for aerobic, and if anaerobic is not producing enough ATP, they can break down their phosphocreatine supplies to make ATP. And then when ATP is in excess, remember they can hydrolyze ATP and use that phosphate to rejoin with a creatine to make more phosphocreatine, to replenish their supplies of phosphocreatine, if you like. So that's the third way. So you've got your aerobic, your anaerobic, and skeletal muscles have this third sneaky way, this phosphocreatine system, so they can always have ATP for muscle contraction. They are not going to run out, basically. Let's have a look at a weirder question. Um, so scientists investigated the time for phosphocreatine to be reformed in leg muscles after the same exercise in healthy people, but they're different ages. So the independent variable is the age of the person, different ages, and they're investigating the time for phosphocreatine to be reformed. So that's what they're measuring. That's their dependent variable. Now the exercise they made them do involve brief, rapid contractions of leg muscles. So, I, I mean, I don't know what exercise they're doing, but some kind of intense exercise with fast contractions of leg muscles. And they're seeing how long it takes for the phosphocreatine to reform. The figure shows the results. Each cross is the result for one person. So we've got age increasing on the x-axis and time for the phosphocreatine to reform is increasing on the y-axis. So it looks like there's a weak kind of positive correlation here, whereby as age increases, the time taken for phosphocreatine to reform in the leg muscles is also increasing. Now, even though there's a positive correlation, there is a lot of variation. Like if you look at people of the same age, let's have a look at people that are 30, there is a lot of variation in the time taken. So suggest a reason for this variation. There's so many things you could say. You could just say um, genetic differences or genetic variation. You could suggest their level of fitness might affect it. You could see, suggest um, the amount of exercise they usually do or their amount of regular exercise. 
You could suggest their sex, their ethnicity, their metabolic rate. It's just a suggest question. So anything that might be different between these people other than age, because we're looking at people of the same age, but there's still a lot of variation in the time taken to reform the phosphocreatine. So other differences that might affect how quickly they can reform their phosphocreatine. You could even say, and I know we haven't learned about this yet, but we are going to, you could even say the numbers of fast and slow muscle fibers or the number of fast twitch and slow twitch muscle fibers, because they might have different proportions, different numbers of them in their leg muscles, and that might affect how quickly phosphocreatine can be reformed. Use your knowledge of fast muscle fibers to explain the data in the graph. Well, we haven't really done fast muscle fibers yet, but let me show you the mark scheme. Now, it is going to be fast muscle fibers that we're thinking about here because it says the exercise involved brief, rapid contractions. So rapid contractions, that implies kind of a lot of intense exercise. I don't know what they're doing, some kind of leg lifts. <laughs> I don't know. But rapid, powerful, intense exercise. So fast muscle fibers are going to be used for rapid or brief as they've described it in the question, or powerful or strong contractions because we are doing exercise. So phosphocreatine is going to be used up rapidly during contraction or to make ATP. Because if you're exercising, you've got fast, rapid contractions. Yeah, think about that sliding filament theory happening quickly, quickly, quickly. It's going to need a lot of ATP. If it needs a lot of ATP, they can quickly use phosphocreatine, hydrolyze it to get the phosphate to phosphorylate ADP to quickly make ATP. But the phosphocreatine is going to be used up rapidly because we've got rapid contractions. So the phosphate, phosphocreatine supplies are going to be used up rapidly to make ATP in their leg muscles. And then as people get older, we can suggest, we kind of need to know this, I suppose, that their metabolic rate does slow down. Did you know that? As you get older, your metabolic rate slows down. Now, your metabolic rate is the speed of all the chemical reactions that happen in your cells, including respiration. So think about it like that. If you're getting older and your metabolic rate is slowing down, your rate of respiration is slowing down. You can say slower respiration. So slower ATP production. Any of those answers would be acceptable. Slower metabolic rate as you age or slower ATP production or slower rate of respiration as you age. Therefore, less ATP to reform phosphocreatine, which would explain why the time taken for phosphocreatine to be reformed is increasing. It's taking them longer to reform their phosphocreatine because their metabolic rate is slower, they're making less ATP during respiration. And if there's less ATP, less ATP to hydrolyze, less phosphate available to reform phosphocreatine. So they're using up the phosphocreatine in their rapid leg muscle contractions. And because their rate of respiration is lower, they've got less ATP available to reform the ATP. So the ATP gets reformed, sorry, the phosphocreatine gets reformed slower. I think I said something wrong then. Yeah, if their rate of respiration is lower, they're making less ATP, they've got less excess ATP available to reform phosphocreatine. So their phosphocreatine is getting reformed more slowly, which is what the graph is showing us, okay? Hopefully that makes sense.